reflecting on the fullness of divinity in Christ mentioned by St. Paul in Colossians, Aquinas distinguished three ways of being of God. Tribus eni modis as Deus in rebus. The first mode is through the general omnipresence of God in all things. The second mode is through grace in the saints. And the third mode is through the hypostatic union in Christ. A few lines earlier, he expanded on this, explaining that God is in everything, because all created things have a similitude to his goodness. But in the saints, God is present also in a new way, in their minds, because by knowing and loving in faith and charity, they reach out to God, and this is an effect of divine grace. And finally, in Christ, God is present also in his body. This differentiation of three modes of being of God seems to be the basis for the division of the Summa of theology. It explains the structure of the work, and it does so with greater clarity than the exitus reditus model, which unfortunately suggests a purely natural return to God through morality that is ineffective, and so it has to be complemented with a path devoted to Christ. Since there are three ways of being of God, the Prima Pass studies God in himself, in the Trinity, and in creation. Therefore, the anthropology given in the Prima Pass describes the creative action of God, recognizable in the goodness of human nature. The Secunda Pars also studies God, but in his second mode of being, as he is present within the sanctified human person, and so it offers a theological anthropology. And the Tertia Pass studies Christ, present, God present in Christ and in the sacraments. God is therefore the subject matter of moral theology. The moral theology of Aquinas is really a full theology and not just an ethics that would be philosophical or even theological. It studies God who is present within human action when the mind or will are moved from within by grace. Aquinas' moral theology does not begin with moral difficulties, with the challenges of his times, nor does it begin with obligations or sins. This moral theology is focused upon God, and it shows what can be done within the human soul as it is transformed by grace. This approach is of perennial value, but it explains also why it is sometimes difficult to correlate the secunda pars with practical human experience. A student who is beginning the study of theology, reading about the infused virtues, divine gifts, and beatitudes, wonders sometimes where he himself is in all of this. This initial perplexity derives from the fact that Aquinas presents the end result of divine transformation something that is not immediately visible, in particular in the initial stages of the moral life. To read the Summa, one has to have at the point of departure a living faith, even a weak faith, but open to the revealed divine mystery. The Secunda Pars makes use of material offered by philosophical ethics, and it may spark the curiosity of a philosopher, but essentially it is a work of theology as it tries to unpack and articulate the truths of faith about Christian moral action. It does not rationally prove the transforming power of grace, something that cannot be done, but it does look into the intelligibility and practical applicability of the fruits of the redemption. In the prologue opening the moral section of the Summa, moral theology is said to depict the divine image that becomes somehow visible in the Christian who is moved by God and who, according to the great defender of the icons, has three characteristics. He engages his intellect, employs his free choice, the liberum arbitrum, and is self-standing, per se potestativum. Thus, the mature Christian with a fully developed personal liberty, capable of individual choices and responses, undertaken creatively for the love of God, shines with divine splendor. It is God who is painting this icon, this divine image on human faces. And this is done not by external cosmetics, but from within, by the power of grace. 
Aquinas did not give us a practical moral teaching that would explain the stages of spiritual growth and react to given pastoral challenges, though he did discuss sins, sins but only insofar as they resist the power of grace. Nevertheless, it has to be said that the magnificent, optimistic presentation of what grace can do in the Christian is extremely useful. It shows the end of the journey. If the end is unclear, then practical steps are confused. We can, however, ask further questions. How are we to interpret those who do not manifest the divine icon in their faces and actions? Is the image of God visible in the mentally retarded and disabled? Sometimes it is, when in their spiritual poverty they show faith centered upon God that expresses itself in gestures of charity. But oftentimes, and in particular in those who are locked in sin and addicted to enslaving actions, the image of God is not visible. Moral theology, therefore, needs to ponder how to offer liberating guidance to those who suffer from impeding blocks that prevent the flowering of grace in their lives. The difficulty of the practical living out of the infused moral virtues. Aquinas, one by one, discussed multiple moral virtues infused by grace. At root, they are all attached to the theological virtues, but the issue, their objects are issues of this world, lived out as ordered towards God. The infused moral virtues pertain to the entire sphere of worldly action, and they have their place in the human psyche. Moral virtues are said to grant facility, speed, and pleasure in good action. It can be also added that they enable creativity, in the reaching out towards the good. This is classical to Thomist teaching, but difficulty in the practical living out of the infused virtues, even among those who presumably are in the state of grace, raises a question whether these virtues really exist. The Roman Catechism, published after the Council of Trent, declared that all the virtues are infused at baptism. The current Catechism, has not followed Aquinas on this point and has opted for the position of Duns Scotus. The theological virtues are said to be infused and the moral virtues are mentioned but without insisting that they are infused by grace. The experience of the Pauline fawn of the flesh suggests it is better to leave the matter hanging. But if there are no moral virtues infused by grace, this means that Christians can relate to God but in the face of their moral weaknesses, they are left alone or condemned to a Pelagian struggle. We can, of course, remind that justification restores the state of grace, but the residue of sin remains, and so the Church has always proposed further means, such as penances, indulgences, almsgiving, restitution for committed evil and pilgrimages that contribute to the healing from moral disorders. But the living out of the infused moral virtues can still be problematic. Did not Aquinas see this practical difficulty? Since Aquinas' main intent in the Summa Pars was the articulation of the working of God within human action, he did not discuss at length the psychic resistances, the resistances that may block the functioning of the moral virtues. He did, however, offer material that allows for the spotting of the exact location of the difficulty and, in consequence, for the looking for ways how it may be unblocked. The reason when it functions within moral action is the same reason that at times works on the theoretical level, but the mode of functioning is different. On the theoretical level, Reason may go through a long process of thought, arriving through syllogisms at the truth. In moral action, there is no time for such reflection. The truth of the matter has to be grasped by reason immediately, and when this is done correctly, the eliciting of moral virtue is easy. But how is the truth of the re object of action to be ascertained in the practical functioning of the reason? It cannot be measured against existing reality because it concerns an object that as yet does not exist. 
Aquinas resolved this dilemma, explaining that the inherent natural finality of the object of choice and the engaged faculty has to be directly perceived and respected, because it is this finality that is the ultimate measure of truth of the practical reason, and so it attributes rectitude to the affective faculties, the will and the emotions that are involved in choice. Things have their inherent meaning, and when that is immediately and correctly grasped by the practical reason, then the subsequent choice of action is simple and virtuous. It happens, however, that the immediate perception of the future object is not in accord with the true fi its true finality, and sometimes repeatedly so, and this blocks the virtue. Aquinas was aware of this. He knew that some people have a connatural that is an instinctive inclination towards that which is unnatural. This is so because the practical reason does not function alone in a purely spiritual way. It is supported by inclinations deriving from the body. Amongst the interior senses, there is the sensitive judgment that immediately grasps the usefulness or harmfulness of a perceived object. In humans, it is called the vis cogitativa because it functions in unison with the practical reason. Nevertheless, it is still sensitive, located in the brain. The judgment of the practical reason that inclines towards a virtue or a vice is therefore not uniquely spiritual. It is conditioned by the sensitive vis cogitativa that sparks a connatural inclination towards a given action. And this connatural inclination, if it is truly in accord with nature, supports the virtue. But this is not always the case. The instinctive judgment may be deformed, as also the vis estimativa of animals is sometimes permanently refocused by humans who have tamed their pattern. It happens amongst humans that some connatural inclinations drive towards that which is unnatural. There are people who object to Catholic moral teaching as it refers to the natural law, and they claim that their nature is different. Nature, of course, in its inherent finalities is unchangeable, but the body is changeable. And so some individuals sense that they are inclined towards that which is said to be contrary to the natural law. Their vis cogitativa, as it supports the practical reason, inclines in a connatural way towards that which is unnatural. Aquinas gave examples of this, noting that, uh, that, that there are people who find pleasure in eating coal or the soil, in having sexual relations with animals and with people of the same sex, and in cannibalism. Such distorted inclinations that impede the functioning of the moral virtue, both acquired and infused, are the consequence of bodily dispositions and wounds, of original sin, of numerous personal sins, and of external cultural influences. Sometimes, as a result, a sort of quasi-habitus is formed within the sensitive usefulness judgment the vis cogitativa, inclining as a fawn of the flesh towards that which is contrary to virtue. When this unnatural inclination is deep-seated, it has a deviating impact on the free choice. St. John Paul II declared, freedom itself needs to be set free. It is Christ who sets it free. Certainly, the exercise of the theological virtue centered upon Christ sparks the light of grace, but it does not necessarily undo the brain-centered internal resistances against virtue, in particular when they are deeply rooted in the psyche and socially conditioned. Now, a few insights from cultural history. Aquinas was aware of the sociological observation made by Julius Caesar who noticed that the ancient Germanic tribes did not see anything wrong in terrorist banditry, latrocinium. These barbarians had an instinctive, positive appreciation of that which is contrary to natural law. Caesar found this bewildering, as most people are shocked when they meet ethnic groups whose ethos connaturally accepts what others consider to be grossly immoral. 
Today, our sociological and ethnographic knowledge is wider, and such encounters are fre frequent. This can be studied. The Polish historian, Felix Konieczny, who lived in the first part of the 20th century, built an entire theory of civilizations constructed upon the observation that peoples have differing views about how common life is to be organized. He studied not the academic work of ethicists, but the instinctive moral perceptions that people had throughout long historical periods. He claimed that the Latin civilization, which has espoused the social doctrine of the Catholic Church, supports a personalist ethics, with the emancipation of the monogamous family from the clan, with the transfer of meeting out of justice from the vendetta to the state, with the assertion that the state is bound to follow moral principles, and with respect of the private law by the public law. In other words, with the following of the principle of subsidiarity. The Byzantine civilization continued in the European Holy Roman Empire, absolute monarchies, and in socialism, elevates the public law, and through a police state and high taxation, reduces the scope for private law, and so for the possibility for grassroots initiatives independent of the state. As a result, it generates high expectations towards the state and a passive sense of entitlement, whereas the more the competence of the state is extended, the more it has to lower its moral standards. The Turanian civilization originated in Mongolia, but it has a vast impact on Russia and other countries of Eastern Europe. It recognizes only the private law, but of only one individual, the Khan, the Tsar, the Sultan, the party leader, or the president. In this civilization, the leader owns the entire state and all his peoples, and is not bound by any moral restrictions. In fact, the more he is brutal, the more he is respected, whereas the rest of society is locked in submissive fear. History has shown that when peoples of differing civilizations intermingle, there is confusion and the lowering of social moral standards. Konechny noted that instinctive perceptions as to what is morally appropriate are deeply rooted and transmitted from generation to generation. A change of ethos, basically meaning the transfer from one civilization to another, is extremely difficult. As a historian, Konechny perceived what Aquinas had termed the instinctive connatural inclinations that condition the practical reason and are located in the distorted vis cogitativa. Such inclinations within the psyche, transmitted by an ethically lower civilization, prevent the cultivation of some moral virtues. Is there a way how this can be healed? Um, the Princeton University philosopher Kwame Anthony Apiach, who originates from Ghana, has looked into the history of ethical revolutions. He studied several moments from universal history in which a dramatic change in the accepted perception of a moral issue came about. First, he looked at the dueling, which was the common way of resolving conflicts among the higher classes of England. This practice, which English law and the Church of England condemned, but also in fact treated as acceptable, suddenly disappeared in 19th century Britain. Then Kwame Apiach studied the Chinese tradition of foot binding. For a thousand years in China, females had their feet bound day and night from infancy to adult life, so as to prevent them from growing. Obviously, this caused extreme pain, but it was held that it is improper for a woman of the higher classes to walk like a peasant girl. The cultured woman had to have the feet of an infant so that she could not walk normally, let alone run. At the term of the 19th and 20th centuries, this practice disappeared. The third radical ethical change was the abolition of slavery by, in the British colonies. In the early decades of the 19th century, a new English working class expressed shock and disgust of slavery, 
even though until quite recently, slave trade had been an important source of British economic power. And finally, Apiach looked into the practice of murdering women in cases of sexual infidelity, and also when the woman had been raped. Historically in Sicily, and even in present-day Pakistan and Afghanistan, family honor requires such violence. Apia noted that quick ethical revolutions came about through a sudden change in the perception of what is honorable. Behavior that elsewhere is immediately deemed to be contrary to the natural law had been maintained for centuries in some social milieus because such practice, practices were tied to a strange understanding of honor. This sense of honor was deeply rooted in certain ethnic or class groups and even more so, where the emancipation of the embryonic family has, had not taken place. When the clan structure or the extended family socially imposes specific mores, it is extremely difficult to break away from them. How can a change in the honor code come about? In the early decades of the 19th century, dueling started to appear among the lower classes in England, and so the higher classes immediately dropped the practice. Uh, physical work in the factories and mines was tedious but respectful, and this led to a greater literacy in the masses. This, inf this information about colonial slavery clashed with the Christian con the conscience of vast segments of the English people, and they protested until the parliament abolished slavery in countries under British rule. When, as a result of trade and mainly Protestant missionary activity, China opened up to the Western world, it suddenly dawned on the Chinese intellectual elite that they were being laughed at by the wild world. In a closed society, foot binding was a sign of distinction, but in the world it was scorned, and so it generated shame. Therefore, the practice was quickly abolished. Apia concludes that radical revolutions of the social ethos and liberation from morally abominable practices come about through changes in the social perception of what is honorable and what is shameful. When the honor code is modified, there are speedy changes of the public ethos. This observation seems to confirm Aquinas' noting that external social habits have an impact on the practical reason, and so when they change, they can liberate the mind to accept the light of the natural law. When the reason and will are freed from the influence of socially conditioned but distorted vis cogitativa, then they may then, with speed, facility, pleasure, and creativity, stimulate the eliciting of the moral virtues. Aquinas had no doubt that goodness has greater power to move, uh, to move than evil. This is a general metaphysical statement but social perceptions and honor codes may stifle this power. Honor is a recurring theme in Aquinas. His prime interest, however, was not social honor, but reverence due to God. The giving of it respects divine excellence and introduces balance in the human faculties, even uh, though it does not increase anything in God. Following St. Paul, Aquinas saw that idolatry, the veneration of something that is known to be, uh, to, uh, known not to be God, is punished by psychic disorders, and in fact is the root cause of homosexuality. One such form of idolatry is avarice, which places trust in riches as if they were the ultimate end. Thus the giving of due honor to God is necessary in religiosity. True honor given to men is a reward for virtue and a sign of honesty. All virtues merit honor, and some like justice and fortitude due, due to their object bring more honor, whereas others like temperance deserve even more honor because they constrain reproachable vi vices. Honor recognizes the goodness of the other and testifies it publicly through words and visible signs. The honored person acquires glory in the sight of others, 
people want to be honored because it is a sign of their goodness, and so they are loved. Those who hold public offices, parents, and the elderly are also honored because they represent virtues and ultimately God, even if personally they do not live up to what they represent. Honor is tied to happiness and maybe its consequence, although it does not consist in it. Some people naturally desire, since people naturally desire happiness, they also desire to be honored, in particular by the wise and the worthy. But expected honor is not the reason why they are virtuous. Nevertheless, they accept it in place of reward from those who have nothing greater to give. If the desire for honor is the only motive for action, it may incline to good works and the avoidance of evil ones, but it does not make a person truly virtuous. The true reward for virtue is happiness itself, and, it's somebody, and if somebody works uniquely for honors, this is not virtue, but sinful ambition. And so the truly virtuous person accepts honors, but is humble, knowing that all goodness derives from God and is given so that it will benefit others. The ambitious person has a disordered desire of honors, either wanting witness to excellence that does not exist, or failing to refer to God the deserved honors, or just being satisfied in the honor without thinking how it may contribute to the good of others, and so such ambition is sinful. Furthermore, the reason for being honored has to be looked into. Some people receive honors from the wicked for the evil that they do. It is not always the wise who express honor, and sometimes it comes from the ignorant who esteem good luck and publicity and not true virtue. Honor is the object of the emotion of hope as it strives for the future ard arduous good. Indirectly, therefore, honor is the object of magnanimity, which is the virtue of human hope. The theological virtue of hope has God as its object, inclining the will to accept the divine mystery as it unfolds itself in life, whereas magnanimity focuses on difficult objects of this world and coordinates psychic forces that are necessary for the tackling of obstacles against the good. This human hope is valid, and so it merits honor. The force to do God and challenging things comes also from the perception that it is honorable to do so. And so there is a proximity between virtue and honor. Thus, it is clear that honor is more in the person that honors that in the per than in the person honored. It is a sign of esteem, and so we may conclude that honor captures the external social pressure that can have an impact on the instinctive reaction of the viscogitativa, and thus it can influence the practical reason as it is engaged in moral action. The admiration of society in things that are, that are good is conducive to virtue, just as a warped code of honor is conducive to acts that are immoral. Honor is coupled with shame, the shame of fault experienced internally highlights the deprivation of glory. It fears grace, it fears disgrace resulting from the fact that the fault is known by others, and so shame is tied with the external social image. Thus, external shame is feared in particular when people who are close know about the fault. There, are, there is no external shame in the face of those who are distant and who know nothing about the committed evil deeds. Both the internally felt shame and the external public shame are not measured by the gravity of the fault. Certain sins, such as pride or achedia, cause great havoc in the life of grace, much more so than carnal sins, and so they are serious faults, but their attached shame is weak. The magnitude of fault is measured by the scale of its turning away from the ultimate end. And so the sins of weakness in the field of sexuality are not as disruptive as the spiritual vices. In fact, sexual sins carry with them a strong dose of humiliation that may lead to a trustful return to God. But they cause great infamy 
because the general public perceives their unsightliness and indecency. Thus, those like journalists who make such sins known generate shame because defamation then becomes extensive. Also, public insult, insults and offensive acts deprive a person of honor. Following Aristotle, Aquinas mentioned a few times a specific virtue that handles the love of honors called philotimia. Strictly speaking, there is no word for a median love of honors, because at times it is called philotimia, and its lack, aphilotimia. The love of honors may be excessive or insufficient, and it may be applied to that which should not be seen to be an honor. And so, in common parlance, the term philotimia does not always refer to a virtue, and sometimes describes that, it, uh, that which is worthy of blame. But basically, the care of one's honor is positive. So generally, the term does have the meaning of a virtue. In the Summa, Aquinas tried to be precise. Honor, as it is received from others, is apprehended by the soul. It may concern an average valued good, or it may concern something great and difficult. Thus, there is a similarity and yet difference between a simple love of honor that is called philotimia, and the love of an arduous good which pertains to the virtue of magnanimity. Philotimia, being a love, is located in the concupiscible appetite, whereas magnanimity, being a hope, is located in the irascible. Further on, Aquinas added a more precise distinction. Since the passions have great power and may resist reason, their regulation has to be handled by appropriate virtues. Not only great issues may deregulate the passions, but also, also small ones. Also minor, basically insignificant honors may be desirable, and so their love may turn out to be problematic. Thus, magnanimity is the virtue that deals with the great and, ardu and arduous hoped for honors, whereas the love of mediocre honors is dealt by, with by another virtue that has no name. But two radical expressions of it have a name, namely philotimia and aphilotimia. Both of them are virtuous. This is because, because, uh, because both he who loves small but justified honors and he who does not care about them may do so in a balanced and therefore virtuous way. In conclusion, it has to be said that Aquinas did not perceive the importance, sorry, it has to be said that Aquinas did perceive the importance of honor attributed by others who esteemed the virtuous person. The desire for social respect is a contributing factor that is conducive to the maintenance of moral virtues. The, appre the appreciation of such esteem is not to be treated as morally dubious, but also indifference to it can be valued. The truly virtuous person does the good because it is good, and not uniquely for the purpose of acquiring honor. So both the philotimus and the aphilotimus have introduced order into their loves, which keeps them on the right track. In conclusion, following the insights of Aquinas, we have to insist that moral theology is about God. It is a part of the second element of the new law of grace that disposes to the grace of the Holy Spirit and shows how to order the use of grace in life. Moral teaching in the church has to focus primarily on the theological virtues that maintain and deepen the contact with God. They are infused by grace, but their exercise requires a con conscious effort of the believing and loving Christian. They open up to grace that ultimately manifests itself in multiple acts of the numerous infused moral virtues. Moral agency, however, may profit from the social support that approves basic values, and also it may be distorted when that support is unbalanced and even contrary to the natural law. Pastoral and social concern for the quality of people's mores 
can be strengthened through attention to social sensitivities, motivations, and perceptions as to what is honorable and what brings shame. These external factors do, not change, do change in societies with time, and these changes are not necessarily haphazard. They can be worked on and directed at least by those who perceive challenges and have some influence on the behavior of society. And in this way, moral revolutions may come about. I have skipped a, a fragment of my text where I spoke about current ethical difficulties, in particular in the field of sexuality, where the joint unitive and procreative significance of sexuality is dismissed and replaced by a purely recreational approach to sexuality, which then means that the, um, the ordering of the sexual desire by the virtue of chastity becomes extremely difficult. And, uh, uh, and this, this is causing a greater uh, uh, a disorder in society. Uh, maybe the uh, revolution in the sense of honor will reintroduce uh, an appreciation of the virtue of chastity. The fact that Aquinas, uh, Aquinas mentioned honor in his moral, synth in his theological synthesis, but often as we read Aquinas, we drop this, we dismiss this, because we think this refers to medieval chivalry. It has nothing to do with our life. Whereas, in fact, this is an important uh, element, important factor uh, that helps to maintain the capacity to perceive the, uh, by, uh, the true good by the practical reason, which is conducive to the moral virtue. Thank you.